Hello and welcome. Good afternoon from New York City and Toronto, Canada. Welcome to the world's oldest Bible science and the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls book launch party. Today, we have the honor of meeting the writer of this amazing book, Dr. Ron Chung. I'll ask a few basic questions to kick us off. And I highly encourage you to grab a pen and a piece of paper to jot your questions so that you can ask them later. I'll guarantee you that you have lots of questions. So throughout this session, you can use the chat function to comment and interact with us. And if you would like to, you can unmute your microphones to ask your questions directly at the end of the session. So Dr. Chung, are you ready to go? Yep. Okay, let's begin. How did this book come about? Can you tell us about it? Well, it started in 1997 when I was uh, at Princeton Seminary and I took a course on the Dead Sea Scrolls by the legendary James Charlesworth. James Charlesworth studied under the original uh, editorial board of Dead Sea Scrolls in history. So he's one of the living legends. And the following summer, I was invited to uh, accept a scholarship to study biblical archaeology in Israel itself. So my first dig was in 1997 in a place called Beth Shemesh. When I was there, the thing that struck me was how much science and technology played such a major role in the excavations and in the analysis of the stuff. The professor who led the uh, group was also a professor who was interested in Dead Sea Scrolls. So that became part of my life as far back as 1997. I waited and waited for someone to write a book on how science and the Dead Sea Scrolls connected because the Dead Sea Scrolls is considered the world's oldest Bible. It never transpired. So about six years ago, I decided, you know what? I'm going to write one myself. I'm tired of waiting for it to happen. And that's how it began. Okay, so why is the Dead Sea Scrolls the world's oldest Bible? Well, before the 1947 discovery, when someone asks you, the Bible you have in your hand, where was it copied from? What is the oldest extant Bible? Extant simply means surviving Bible we have. And the oldest, and it's not even complete, is the one called the Aleppo Codex, dated to AD 925, meaning the oldest copy of the Bible we have is a thousand years at the time of Jesus. That's a very long time. So scholars and Christians alike were quietly very nervous about this. If we ever find something that goes back to Jesus' time, is it going to be the same book? Is it going to be different? How is it different? We know that it will be a bit different. We suspect it will be different because we have multiple copies of even the 1,080 books. There are several books in that period. So but until 1947, we don't have any physical proof. So in 1947, when that was discovered, the whole stash of 100,000 to 200,000 fragments and scrolls, the, um, the race began to see who's going to see what fit where. It took almost 50 years and a lawsuit for it to come out. And one reason it took so long was because this is something interesting. The entire editorial board of the first Dead Sea Scrolls um, team were not Jews at all. They were Christians, Catholics, Protestants, but Jews, they were systematically um, not allowed to participate. There were a lot of reasons, some political, some just sheer anti-Semitism, but that was the problem. And later on, they, they reversed that and changed it now. The entire team are um, mostly um, mixed from Christians to some non-religious people, but they knew the book well, as well as Jews. So that's why we now establish that the Gitsi Scrolls are part of the world's oldest Bible. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's go back to the book. Can you tell us briefly what to expect from the book and to the participants, feel free to um, write your comments and uh, we'll get to your questions and comments uh, in a little bit. Well, for those of you um, in New York City, you may be interested to know that four of the seven most important scrolls were sold in New York City in a hotel called the um, Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Some of you may remember that in 49th Street. The discovery was 1947. So the first chapter, I'm going to talk about a discovery, historical discovery, how a young boy, his friend, they were looking for a goat was lost inside a cave. They threw rocks inside. They heard the sound of something that looked like, that sounded like clay. And inside were three scrolls that were later sold in the market. Sold to a cobbler called Kando, but that's another story. 
In any case, the seven are reunited. In chapter two, I'm gonna mention why there is no complete scroll. Every scroll is incomplete. So that became a problem for the editors to say, shall we tell the whole world we have, say for example, the book of Isaiah, because it wasn't complete. There are holes everywhere, some are broken bits, so it took some time. In chapter two, I'm gonna mention three things that was very important in archeology, span identifying, dating, and editing the scrolls. And the last bit is the most important. The takeaway from that is, in the development of any Bible, the modern Bibles we have, the Dead Sea Scrolls are the 1,000 year old Bible. It's all about the personal judgments of the editors. Editors are human. They've got to make personal judgments. And it involves many different words that came about to express one part of the Bible and different scrolls might have different words sometimes. They've got to decide which one is the likely correct one as far as they're concerned. And every responsible editor knows there's no such thing as the perfect judgment. They do the best they can. And that's why every few years, there's another translation, another version of the Bible. In chapter four, I'm gonna mention something some of you who have been studying with me will recognize the seven Eurasian civilizations that contributed to the writing of the Bible. Mesopotamia, Egypt, Assyria, Babylonia, the Persians, Greeks, Hellenistic Greek that is, and the Roman Empire. These seven civilizations, their languages, their culture contributed to it. And I also mentioned two um, groups within the Jewish world called the Maccabeans and the Hasmoneans. You will not hear much about them unless you have read the Catholic Bible, which is bigger than the Protestant Bible, and you have the Maccabees. The Maccabees politicized the religion by joining together the king and the priest. It's almost like in Tibet, if the Dalai Lama would be allowed to go back to Tibet, he would be both the king as well as the priest of that religion, really Tibetan Buddhism. It hasn't happened in any other modern country that we know of, except possibly Nepal at one time, because Nepal is the world's only Hindu country, not India, Nepal. India is a democracy. Nepal is a Hindu country. I'm also going to mention the Hasmonean, which was an indigenous uh, Jewish Israeli group. And therefore, the first time in their history, they began to wage war for economic rather than spiritual grounds, something not really understood or mentioned in the Christian world. But the surprising thing you discover was in this period. In chapter five, I'm going to mention about the five things you should know about the Bible and to know the five things you should read the books to tell you what the five things are, right? In chapter six, I mentioned the importance of community interpretation and validation. Some people say, how, how does any community of Christians know that this particular book is the authority? And for the longest time, the uh, term that's used generally is God told somebody, or God in, told a Holy Spirit invited somebody. And that's all nice and good for a religious community. But for an academic community, they want more than that. What do you mean when you say the Holy Spirit guided you? So we discover from the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were very open about it. It was community interpretation and validation, meaning every local community of the various Jewish sects, they interpreted the Bible differently and they determined the authority. So that was something that the modern Christian can learn from, that in Jesus' time, the discussion was not so much about Holy Spirit guiding me. The discussion was, what does our community think? In chapter seven, I mentioned the four different competing Jewish communities. They were all called Jewish people. They all use the similar but not identical collections of books. And one of them emerged to become the Jesus movement. And from the Jesus movement, the fourth century AD, they became what we now call modern Christianity. In chapter eight, it's the story of Abraham to Jesus, where I describe in more detail how this early religion, which is a national religion of a people group, emerged to become a global religion called Christianity. And chapter nine, uh, the title is From Stories to Scriptures. Here, we're going to ask about how these books were authorized to become the scriptures. And chapter 10, probably the most interesting for me, it's a lot to do with the sciences. It's called Science and God's Revelation. And we'll discuss the three R's, how in every religion, in every holy book, the scriptures were retold, reinterpreted, and rewritten, every one of them. You do not find in any religion any holy scriptures that has not been revised in any way. And there are some good reasons. One of them is 
human language change. The way we use identical words have changed its meaning over time. Now in the book, I mentioned an example of the word virus because the word virus is a Latin word simply meaning poison. Now today, we think of virus as coronavirus, the word that infects us, but this idea of the coronavirus didn't appear in the early days because in the early days, they didn't know about it. All they knew was something is killing bacteria. So that something was poisonous to bacteria. And that's why they call it a virus. By 1937, they invented the first electron microscope. For the first time, we can just about see something like a virus. Now, of course, by the 1970s, 80s, the word virus was changed again. And now we think of the virus as a computer virus, a code that changes. So I give you the history of that. A single word, how it changes its meaning over time. So can you imagine of any word in the Bible, 2,000 years, if you look back to the Old Testament, you add another 500 years. That's a lot of words changing meaning. So every translation of a Bible, every version, is an accommodation to try to capture what these words mean to us today. So that's, um, that's a 10 chapters um, in a nutshell. Thank you so much for sharing a summary of each chapter from the book. Um, as I worked on each chapter with you, I've learned so much. And uh, I highly encourage you guys to buy the book if you haven't checked it out yet. Um, speaking about the book, why don't you show us how it looks like? This is the hot cover in blue. And this is the paperback in orange. As you can tell, they are massive books. They're not your regular six inch, by five inch paperback. This is full size, that's the size. And the reason we chose that was because of uh, Christine's infographics, because we want to make sure that people can read it because they can be quite big. Well, apart from that, we've got the um, scientific work as well, on particle physics. So we make sure it's small enough. Uh, sorry, it's big enough to see. And let me just show you. So this is one infographic on reinterpreting revelation, a whole page. If you reduce this to a small paperback page, you're gonna squint your eyes and can't see much of anything. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's why this is another example of a chart that asked the question, when the devil brought Jesus up to the highest mountain to see all the kingdoms of the world, are we to interpret that as a literal event or a symbolic event? And some people still think it's literal. So I gave the mathematical and physical reasons why it's unlikely to be the case because Jesus had to go so high up, it'll be 121 times the height of Mount Everest today. He would have to endure a temperature of minus 85 degrees Fahrenheit and air pressure, very low pressure. So it's unlikely, which means, but at the time it was written, people didn't know that. A lot of people thought if you go high enough, you can see everything at a time when a lot of people felt the world was flat, although the Greeks already suggested that the world might be curved or round, but there was still a common understanding that if you go high enough, you can see further and further and further. So we now know that's not the case. And this is an example of how science and technology can sort of keep us honest, not about the text, the text is the text, but to keep us honest in our interpretation of it. We have one question in the chat, but I do have one last question for you to answer while we get uh, wait for more um, questions and comments in the chat. So don't be shy, guys. Uh, start interacting with us. So my last question to you. You mentioned in a post um, on social media that, that this is perhaps your most important book to date. So <laughs> in this book, you mentioned at the end of chapter 10 about spiritual integrity. Can you explain to us what this means? In the academic world, when we talk about um, academic freedom, a professor will say, I want the freedom to research so that no one who funds the research can tell me what I can and cannot say on my conclusions. That's an issue of academic integrity. In the spiritual world, I think it exists as well. Except in the spiritual world, we don't really have something called peer review where people will check what you say as a, a religious scholar um, from the context of belief. You can check what you say from the context of history, of um, linguistics and all that. What I wanted was, can we meld the two together? Meaning, can we have someone who believes in God also take seriously the questions that others ask of them, which means there are no sacred cows as such. Every doctrine, every teaching that I'm involved in, um, be open to people to ask questions. Why? Partly because we you know beliefs are either um, inherited, adopted, or adapted, and very often all three. We adopt 
our beliefs that we heard from our parents, from teachers, from our friends. And over time, as our lives change, our ideas change, we, we keep adapting them until it reflects what we believe. So that changes as well. And the other issue about integrity was it led to um, me writing a great deal. And then, as you know, Christine will have to take over in a few seconds. And then one day, uh, Christine went to my website and she saw that. And just to tell you, you know, she's not a Christian. She's a Taoist, Buddhist. And well, you take over, Christine. Tell us the story of how the infographics came to delay. Oh, my this goodness. Movie. You're putting me on the spot. I wasn't prepared yes, for this. <laughs> Um, just a little bit of background. Um, so I'm from Malaysia. Uh, I've been an instructional designer of 16 years. And what that means is that I design instructions. So that means I create learning material, but in today's world, it usually is in the corporate space for most instructional designers. So most of what I do is that I identify learning opportunities and then I recommend, and sometimes I create learning solutions. So on this project, I saw an opportunity to stretch my instructional design skills to apply to a subject matter that I've always been interested in, uh, and that is religion. And I'll come back to this in a little bit. So when I saw Dr. Chung's content, I fell in love with it. So there was so much untapped opportunity to simplify uh, complex information and, and apply data visualization skills for mass consumption. I really felt that everyone needs to know what he has to say. He's put his entire life into the information that you read in this book. So going back to religion, um, as Dr. Chung mentioned, I, I'm not a Christian, but um, while what I learned um, while working on this book was exactly that spiritual integrity. So my involvement in this project inspired me to use his methodologies to truly understand my own faith and the journey that I'm on. So um, yeah, so you see, you see my work in the book. It's my first rodeo. Um, I hope you guys enjoy it, but uh, let's get to the questions in the chat. Joanne? It's an example of Abraham to Jesus. Um, just, just to mention, this infographic so inspired my own sister, who did not read a book like this. She saw the infographic and she said, oh, now I sort of understand the connection between Abraham and Jesus. I never see the connection uh, normally, and she wanted to learn more. So when it affected my own family, I realized that infographics are really um, the way nowadays for people to capture information in a single page. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so thank you. Um, Joanne has a question. What is your preferred Bible version? Um, it depends on for what purpose. At the seminary, we normally use the, what is called an RSV, the standard version going back to 1971. Now that particular one was chosen because Bibles are normally chosen for a variety of reasons. Some for easy reading, say the Living Bible. Some of them because they want word-to-word -word connection, and another one is thought-to-thought -thought connection. The NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version, claims to try to do the best of both worlds, but no one can do everything, so by definition. But just to let you know how transient these things are, I've got quite a few copies of uh, various types of NRSV, but next year in 2020, a three-year project that, that has become a five-year project, partly because of COVID-19. In 2022, a new version will be launched. It's called the NRSV UE, Updated Edition. Some people, they want to have one person's idea of the entire Bible, and that's one. In the book, I mentioned it. It's Eugene Peterson's The Message. Some of you will recognize that. That has become its own translation. That has become a 20th century translation. That's one person. Now, as an academic, you normally don't want to have one person's translation. It's a bit risky. You want to have as many people as possible as a committee, and that's what you do in the NRSP. Okay, I just want to let everyone know that our Zoom meeting, which is the free version, will end in less than 10 minutes. So um, thank you. Uh, we have one question from Judith. Could you address the news item recently that the Bible Museum in DC indicated that the Dead Sea Scrolls they received and have on display after investigation have been declared fixed in your response. Yes, that's, 
that's actually in chapter nine, uh, Judy. Believe it or not, while we were working on this, about to publish in March, the news came out back to back, two days. One news was fantastic, one news was rather sad. So the sad one was after quite a few months, and in fact, quite a few years of uh, due diligence checking it, the Bible Museum and I uh, commend them for it, were honest enough to say all 16 fragments of the Dead Sea Scrolls we have are modern 20th century forgeries. You could only discover this from technology, otherwise you couldn't. So another example of why science and technology is so important. Within a 24 hour period, another announcement came up from the Israel's um, Antiquities Authority that they have found new Dead Sea Scrolls in yet another space. So now every book on the Dead Sea Scrolls is out of date, except mine, <laughs> because I just published it, right? So every book you have, they haven't included this. By April, mid-April, again, we were ready to publish, and then something else happened, another news came out from the Dutch scientists that they have now used artificial intelligence to look at the first of the big scrolls we discovered called the Great Isaiah Scroll, and determine that in fact, there were at least two, two writers, two scribes. Their writing styles were different, but they learned from each other, and eventually over time, their writing styles co coalesced into like a single writing style. Again, technology was the one that allowed us to even know that. The assumption we had in the past was one person wrote everything down, and there was a lot of confusion. If one person wrote it down, why did he write differently in certain parts? Now we know there were two people because it's a very big book, it's 66 books to make up the Isaiah scroll. So this is one, uh, one reason why we delayed again until I think final print uh, was April 20th. No, sorry, April 23rd. So this is a very, very new book and it included that bit. Now, Judy, if you're asking, what does it mean for us Christians that the 16 fragments that was put into a museum is now shown to be um, forgeries, right? Like other museums, the Bible Museum that was started by a single family, I think it's a green family, they purchase from private um, sellers. And when you do that, there's always a risk. There's nothing called a provenance which tells you where did you get it from, where did you get it from to the very earliest, right? The museums of the world, like the Metropolitan and the Brooklyn Museum and uh, the British Museum, they would not do any of these because it's too risky. So it was a private museum, a lot of funding, um, and I think in good faith. I do not for one moment think they meant to, um, to lie to anybody. They were excited. The owner made a lot of money from his business, and he wanted to honor God by having a museum that can collect his own collection from other collections. But it, it kind of um, warns us on the dangers of rushing to make proclamations and statements that could embarrass us later when the data comes up. But I, I want to say um, that I commend the owner of this museum that when they were confronted with the data, they didn't say, they didn't shut it down. They said, I want to spend a lot of money on independent um, investigators to confirm if it is original or it's um, a fraud. All right, we have less than uh, five minutes to go and two more questions in the chat. Is the, uh, Ravi asked the question, is the NRSV and the revised standard version from the same editor or are they from different denominations? There is, the Bible, the NRSV is not a denominational Bible. It's not a Catholic Bible, it's not a Protestant Bible. It's a Bible largely used for scholars who, once you study as a scholar, all the denominational interests don't mean much to you because you're going way back. Before there were Baptists, before there were Protestants, before none of these stuff are important when you actually study the Bible as the Bible. And the NRSD is the new standard, uh, new revised standard version. It's the same thing, uh, Ravi. Um, did I answer the question fully? Was that it? Uh, uh, yeah, that's right. Um, and the last question we have in the chat from Drew, what is the change or impact you hope to have on a reader who picks up this book to read, who has never read anything else by you? Very good uh, question. Some of you know, in the year 2000, I started a program called Project Timothy, where, you are, where people have the chance to read all 850,000 words of the Bible, of the Protestant Bible, in a three-year period. And I uh, published three books to accommodate that. Looking back now, I realized that they should have read this book first, because this is a primer to those three books. And the reason is this. 
whenever we study the Bible, those three books, people will say, but the Bible says this, and the Bible says that. When you read this book, you know there's no such thing as the Bible, because there were multiple versions, even in Jesus' time. So that was a shocking thing to, to discover. Um, for those who have never read any books before, I hope they get two things out of this. Number one, the Bible is a work in progress. And as important as the Bible is, God's private revelation has always been nature. Nature has been around long before anyone learned to write. And I have the timeline to show that when someone says the writing of the Bible is the most important thing, I'll show you how recent it was in human history. I'll show you that writing is only 5,000 years old. So anyone living before that didn't even write, for example. Oral tradition is very important, but it changed over time. And finally, after the 19th century, less than 10% of the world's humans could read and write. That just tells you writing has always been a very elite form of knowledge. That's one thing. The um, second thing that I think would be important is to show that I, as a confessional Christian, but if you take scholarship seriously, you want to be able to be comfortable questioning your own assumptions because they all have assumptions. And the history of the church has been a conflict of assumptions. Every time there's a war, a religious war, especially in Europe between the Catholics and the Protestants, and then later on uh, with the Orthodoxy, it's all about interpretations, which means the Bible is not the problem. The problem is us making assumptions in the way we interpret things. We need to be very humble about it. We need to hold on to doctrines very lightly because we do not know everything. Thank you, Dr. Right. Chu. Uh, last question from Holly. Is this book suitable for non-scholars to read? Absolutely. In fact, Christine, you know this, the original <laughs> title was The Dead Sea Scrolls in Plain Language. I think Danny also knew about that. I, I met Danny, uh, who is on the screen, was one of the uh, proofreaders. So he went through some of this as well. And then I think by the time the infographics came, by the time I, wrote, I rewrote the book to accommodate the infographics, because infographics are so useful that I realized it makes more sense for them to capture it this way. And then I think someone said, you know, Ron, I'm not sure you want to use the phrase uh, for in plain language anymore because it's not as plain as you might think. It's quite substantial. But it doesn't take away from the fact that the entire book does not require to know any of the biblical languages or Latin. It does, it's all in English. Sorry. Sorry. Our session is going to end soon. I have a note here that says less than a minute. So if you get cut off, I, I just want to say thank you everyone for coming today. This recording will be put on our YouTube channel as well as on other social media platforms. So um, continue engaging and interacting with us on our posts and uh, we will follow up with a link to buy the book. So hopefully you've enjoyed this session. Um, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay. Thank uh, you. Thank you.